Okay, well, let's um, now turn to the first of the diseases we're going to talk about, the one with the highest prevalence, and that is polycythemia vera. Uh, Robin, why don't you guide us through some of the initial steps in your clinical evaluation of these patients and challenges in making the diagnosis? Sure. So the most typical referral I'll get is for erythrocytosis. And really the question is, is it primary or is it secondary? Certainly getting erythropoietin level can help with that, and especially if I see that EPO level being um, low, really clues me in that something might be going on in the bone marrow. It is notable that some MPN patients actually will have a normal or even a high APO level. So I think Mary Francis, some of your group has actually characterized that. Um, the other thing that I really think about is what are the blood counts done over time? So I want to see a history of what the blood counts are as best I can. There is, a, in the WHO 2016 criteria, a little bit of a loophole. hole. Some patients can actually, if their blood counts are high enough, you, they say that you may not need the bone marrow. I agree with Moshe, though, though, that I really do like to see the bone marrow biopsy in all the patients that are willing to get one. From there, I, especially specific to my practice, I ask a lot about symptom burden. A lot of patients will be having things like uh, itching, headaches, especially in polycythemia vera. I think that you see that itching being really a, a problem. Um, I look for erythromyalgia-type symptoms. But otherwise, uh, spleen-related symptoms, especially if splenomegaly is present, so abdominal discomfort, early satiety. There also can be constitutional symptoms, things like night sweats, fevers, uh, generalized fatigue. When I first approach the patient, I also really want to see what their thrombotic risk has been. Do they have a history of thrombosis? I'm looking at factors as well as their age, smoking status, and then cardiovascular risk factors, so things like hypertension, hyperlipidemia, that all really go into my initial um, prognosis of, an M of a PV patient. I'm also looking at blood counts. More than ever, we know that a white blood cell count, uh, even with a well-controlled hematocrit, may or may not play a role in thrombotic risk. So what I heard you say is that you use more than just some arbitrary age cutoff. In, in the United States, I think it's 60 in Europe, 65, mm -hmm. um, and a history of thromboses, but all of the other cardiovascular risk factors, and you threw in white count as well. I, I am interested in that. Uh, so uh, I think along with John's group and then our group as well, we've been kind of looking at this to really better understand what the role of the white blood cell count is. Um, we, uh, we did a specific analysis of the VA database where it, even with well-controlled hematocrit, it did seem to play a role, but then we also recently looked uh, at another cohort of PV patients where it didn't play as much of a role. Uh, the real question is, in a prospective study, what happens if you control the white blood cell count? And that's really, uh, I think, where the critical uh, issue is going to be in the future. So, so John, so um, let's say you have a patient who, you know, doesn't have splenomegaly or symptoms, but um, has a high hematocrit. You can control them with phlebotomy, put them on aspirin, but their white count is just consistently above normal. Is that a patient you would give cytoreductive therapy to? So, you know, I think um, the answer is it's complicated um, because the problem is. Um, our, I think our understanding, although it has increased over the last few decades, um, we still don't totally understand, I think, the, the mechanisms at play that really promote thrombosis. They're varied. So it's probably leukocyte activation. It's the right milieu of uh, endothelial cell activation in the right person with uh, stasis from a high hematocrit uh, with cardiovascular you know, comorbidities added in. So I, I don't think that the white count per se I, I don't think there's anything magical about a white count of 13,000 versus 16,000 versus 9,000. Um, and I, the problem I have is many of the guidelines um, talk about uh, uncontrolled polycythemia vera with high white counts and controlling the white count, but there's very little data actually uh, available, prospective data, that would suggest that controlling the white count actually affords the patient a risk reduction in thrombosis or progressive disease. And as Robin mentioned, we did a, a retrospective study that's presented here at ASH of over 11 centers throughout the United States, um, over 500 patients in total, um, and using a trajectory-based model, we really found no association with uh, elevation of the white count and thrombotic risk. With progressive disease, which makes sense, yes, but not thrombotic uh, uh, risk. And the same holds for thrombocytosis. There's really no literature that supports bringing the platelet count to a specific platelet number really affords the patient a platelet risk. So one of the, I think, most challenging, sometimes frustrating aspects in MPNs is we have guidelines that a lot of us use, but they're not, they're not terribly evidence-based, um, and that's, that becomes challenging. So to your answer, to your question, uh, if I have a low-risk patient, young, who's not had thrombosis, and their white count's 13,000, I do not push the white count down for the sake of uh, beautifying the CBC report. I, I hematocrit, 
control under 45% by the CytoPV study, uh, low dose aspirin, and you know, cardiovascular modifiable risk factor. So let me push you just one little bit. Okay, so you picked a single point in time, a certain number, 13,000. None of us are really upset about that. But how about over time, if you see 11,000, 13,000, 15,000? Does the trend, the kinetics change your decision making? So again, you know, we did this uh, study that would suggest that uh, even the trends, even up to 35,000, don't predict thrombotic risk. So it's, it's still unclear. Now, if one has a more overarching goal of disease course modification, one can make the argument that employing drugs perhaps like interferon alpha may have a more overarching benefit, um, both thrombotic and disease course modifying. But Really, we don't we don't have great evidence that that reducing that plate, like that uh, white count to any specific number affords the patient any immediate benefit. 